Okay, we can start now. Uh, welcome everyone. We are pleased to announce uh, the special seminar uh, in the ICTS string seminar series by Professor Edward Witten from the Institute of Advanced Study, Princeton. He will be talking about uh, no ensemble averaging below the black hole threshold. Thanks okay. again, uh, Professor Witten. Yeah. Thank you for the introduction and also for the invitation to give this talk. So it's based on a paper that I've indicated here. So let's first remember the basic idea of holographic duality between an ordinary quantum field theory on the boundary of space time and quantum gravity in the bulk. So if you want to compute the partition function of a conformal field theory, of boundary conformal field theory on a D manifold M, you sum over all manifold X, whose dimension is one more, all manifold X of dimension D plus one, So here's the schematic picture. M is the boundary in which we want to calculate the partition function. And we do it by summing over all manifolds X with boundary M. And then we integrate over the metric and sum over matter fields weighted by the exponential of minus the action and so on. Now this, this works very well as long as the boundary M is connected. But there's a puzzle as soon as the boundary isn't connected. Here I've considered a case where the boundary consists of two components, M and M prime. And as I've drawn, it's possible to have a connected boundary, sorry, it's possible to have a connected bulk manifold X, even though the boundary is not connected. So how do we interpret amplitudes associated to a connected Euclidean signature bulk manifold X, whose boundary is disconnected? In the case I've drawn, the boundary is the union of two components, M and M prime. Well, in such a case, it looks like the path integral on X is trying to compute a connected correlation function between the partition functions Z of M and Z of M prime of the two boundary components. From a conventional point of view, this does not make any sense. Since in a given boundary CFT, Z of M and Z of M prime for a given conformal structure on M or M prime are just numbers. In other words, in a conventional point of view, it seems that we're trying to calculate the connected correlation function between two numbers, like the connected correlator of three and seven, which of course doesn't make any sense. A new perspective came from JT gravity in two dimensions, which is a simple enough model that it could be fully analyzed. In that case, since the gravitational theory is in two dimensions, you'd expect the dual to be an ordinary quantum mechanical system on the one dimensional boundary characterized by a Hamiltonian H. <clears throat> Assuming the boundaries are compact, they're just circles. Say of circumference beta and beta prime, in which case we'd expect the partition functions to be the trace of e to the minus beta H or e to the minus beta prime H. But Saad, Schenker, and Stanford showed that JT gravity is not dual to a particular quantum mechanical system with a definite Hamiltonian, but to a random matrix ensemble. In other words, an ensemble of Hamiltonians with the Hamiltonian, a random matrix drawn from an ensemble that they characterize. Averaging over a random ensemble of H's naturally, well, first of all, it makes the partition function a random variable that depends on the random variable H. And once the partition function is a random variable, naturally you can get connected correlation functions. <clears throat> so they got from the random matrix point of view, connected correlation functions, which from a bulk point of view, uh, one would interpret as resulting from uh, the contributions of connected manifolds with this connected boundary. So this picture, this picture with the connected bulk, but the disconnected boundary matched the fact that H was really a random matrix rather than a definite Hamiltonian. In the particular case of JT gravity in two dimensions, it's a very compelling story. And it's beautifully related to the famous work of the Iranian fields medalist, Mariam Yitzhakani on the volumes of moduli spaces of Riemann surfaces.
Now that suggested that possibly the resolution of the puzzle is the same in examples of the duality in three or more dimensions. Saying the resolution is the same is that there isn't a definite boundary theory, but rather an ensemble of boundary theories. But there's an obvious objection to this proposal, which is that in standard examples of the duality, there's no suitable ensemble of boundary theories. In many much studied examples of the duality in dimension three and higher, constructed from string slash n theory, it's believed that all the parameters in which the boundary theory depends are known, and that the bulk theory depends on all the same parameters. For example, there's ADS4 times S7 and ADS7 times S4. The only parameter is if you keep the maximal symmetry is a positive integer n. And n can be measured, well, n is a parameter of the boundary theory, but it can also be measured in the bulk because for example, Newton's constant depends on n or n can be measured as a certain flux integral over the sphere S7 or S4. So n is the only boundary parameter, but it's also a bulk observable. So um, for given bulk theory, which has a definite measurable n, there's no possible ensemble of boundary theories. There's only one. Many other examples have more than one integer parameter, sometimes also real parameters. But in many cases, all parameters of the boundary theory are known and the bulk theory depends on all of the same parameters. So in a given bulk theory, where you measure the bulk, the, all, the, all the parameters, what could one possibly be averaging over in an ensemble average? So on that grounds, I think it seemed relatively clear that in standard examples of the duality in dimension three and higher, there actually is no ensemble. And therefore, uh, th there's a problem with the proposal to interpret disconnected boundaries in terms of ensemble averaging. And this talk will sharpen the puzzle by arguing that there's a class of observables that are not subject to any apparent ensemble averaging in the sense that these particular observables only receive contributions from manifolds with connected boundary. These are what we could call sub-threshold observables where the threshold is the black hole threshold. I'll basically make precise the assertion that as long as you look at states that are not black holes, you don't see any evidence for ensemble averaging. If you take n to infinity, or from a bulk point of view, if you take Newton's constant g to zero, keeping fixed the excitation energy above the ground state, you see a spectrum of states that has a large n limit. And these are not black hole states. And the proposal is that the energy spins and couplings of these states are not subject to ensemble averaging. These are all the states in the following sense. If you keep fixed the energy above the ground state, no matter what it is, then for a sufficiently large n, whatever state you're looking at is in this class that I'm describing. So every state for a sufficiently large n is what I'm calling a sub-threshold state. And therefore, in a certain sense, I'm telling you that I'm going to argue that the energies couplings and spins of all states are not subject to ensemble averaging. I put n spins in parentheses because, because the spin is a discrete parameter one might have anyway assumed it couldn't be affected by ensemble averaging. So more broadly, I'll claim that an, an observable that can be expressed just in terms of energy spins and couplings of the sub-threshold states will receive contributions only from manifolds with connected boundary. Another way to describe the observables not subject to ensemble averaging is that they're the observables that can be computed by integrability. So there are examples of ADS-CFT duality that are integrable for large n, not all examples, but some important examples. And not in those, but when you do have integrability, you can't study the black holes by integrability, but you can study a large class of observables by integrability. The claim I'll make is that the observables you can study by integrability are precisely the ones not subject to ensemble averaging. 
integrability precisely accesses everything that isn't a black hole. So people who are studying integrability never feel that they're studying an ensemble of theories. It feels like it's a definite theory. So I'll be saying that from the standpoint of integrability, there's no hidden ensemble. So the concrete evidence will come entirely from the three-dimensional case and from studying classical solutions in which ADS3 is replaced by a different classical solution of Einstein's equations in three dimensions with the same conformal boundary or with the appropriate conformal boundary, depending on what observable we study. Edward, can I ask yes? a question? Please, yes. Uh, so this is a statement about uh, observables which involve operators whose energies don't scale with n squared, with n, but That's rather right. are constant. But yes. uh, is there a statement to be made for observables that involve operators whose energy scale with n, but with a power that is smaller than two, or appropriate uh, power that That's is available? Question. That's a good question. Uh, until you got to the statement less than two, I was going to tell you that the, the ones whose energy scales like n squared are, are subject to ensemble averaging. Yeah. Uh, um, I, I think it's worth studying it more. I don't know the answer. Okay, thank you. I feel that, I'm not sure. I feel that the answer will be similar to the question of whether you can study them by integrability. I, my guess is that whatever you, I, I, I don't know, but I suspect that what you can study by integrability will never show a sign of ensemble averaging. And anything you could call a black hole uh, will show a sign of ensemble averaging. Okay, thank you. And. I wouldn't be surprised if uh, everything is one of those two, but I don't know. So if there's really a class of observables not subject to any ensemble averaging, that strongly indicates that there's no ensemble averaging. In examples of duality of the duality derived from string slash M3 <clears throat> in dimension three and above. But that raises the question, why does anything appear to have apparent ensemble averaging? I'll also make a proposal for that at the end of the talk. So any other questions before I go ahead and explain what's the evidence for the conjecture or for the claim? Yeah, I, I have a, a question. Yes. So uh, we know that, uh, you know, black holes obey the, this, this chaos bound. Yes. Right. And um, they're not and just I, a saturated uh, in the ground. Saturated, that's right. And um, <clears> as, <throat> as you said, um, integrable versions of ADS CFT uh, do not include uh, systems with black holes, right? Well, no, the system has black holes, but observables that involve the black holes aren't accessible by integrability. There's a subtlety. Right, right. right. Okay. So okay. When, you have, when you have a model that's integrable for large n, it's integrable. Integrability to enables you to study what happens for large n keeping the energy fixed. Mm. It doesn't. Integrability fails if you take large n with the energy of order n squared. Mm -hmm. okay. If you no, I mean, I mean, is it is it possible to make a statement uh, that uh, the formation of of a black hole destroys integrability? Well. That's a slightly more picturesque language that I would use. I, I say the same thing more technically and perhaps more narrowly. Integrability governs the states that have fixed energy as n goes to infinity. Integrability, first of all, is an asymptotic statement in a one over n expansion. So that's why we're talking about what happens for large n. Integrability, the, none, none of these examples of the duality are integrable for n equals seven or for n equals a million and one. They're only integrable perturbatively in an expansion in asymptotic expansion in one over n. So therefore, okay, anything we discuss, we have to say what it's doing for large n. Integrability governs what happens for large n keeping the energy fixed. It doesn't govern what happens for large n with energy of order n squared. As in the question before yours, if we want to take the energy to infinity like n or something, there are different ways to do that, and they might not all lead to the same answer. One might be a small black hole, one might be a giant graviton. So it, it's probably more complicated than this well understood. Any other questions? Uh, 
Edward, a, a quick question, please. If you consider the four point function of four small operators, single yeah. trace operators yeah. at finite values of cross ratios at zero temperature, yes. that an observable that falls into your. Yes, that should not have ensemble averaging. Uh, what can that, that it receives some contributions from very high energy states suppressed by e to the power minus n square maybe, but, uh, oh, is that wrong? That might be true, but regardless, it's not subject to ensemble averaging. Okay, thank you. Let, let me suggest we come back to that question. Thank you. Uh, th uh, th there's a technical issue that makes me not want to discuss the question right now, because I'm going to go to things that are similar, but technically more straightforward to discuss. I would suggest we return to the question later. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? Hello. If, yes. I, if I may ask, uh, so is supersymmetry important for the statement of whether there is ensemble averaging or not for these kind of observables? No. No. Yes, okay. Thank you. I mean, I, I think the answer is no. Uh, I've made it, my conjecture, okay. The assertion, the proposal I've made, okay, supersymmetry will play no role in the evidence I will give for the proposal. Okay, thanks. So, as I said, at the end of the talk, I'll explain why some observables have apparent ensemble averaging, or at least I'll make a proposal. But for now, I just want to point out something we've already said, that the observable subject to apparent ensemble averaging involve black holes. Now, in anti de Sitter space, there's a Hawking page transition. Above this transition, you see black hole states, below it, you do not. The sub threshold observables that I claim don't see ensemble averaging are the ones that involve states below the black hole threshold. I guess I've explained that already. Perhaps it's worth mentioning before going on. So two dimensional JT gravity was the prototype of a theory that is interpreted in terms of an ensemble. So it's worth pointing out that there, there's no black hole threshold. In effect, all states are black holes. That's why in that example, everything seems to be subject to ensemble averaging. Anyway, let's discuss three dimensions. So even before ADS-EFT duality was understood in general, Brown and Hano discovered that in an as in an ADS3 like universe, that means in a universe asymptotic at spatial infinity to anti de Sitter 3 space, there's a boundary stress tensor as if, as, let me finish, as if there's a 2D conformal field theory on the boundary of the universe. In terms of Newton's constant G and the radius of curvature L, the central charge of the stress tensor is 3L over 2G. <clears throat> Sorry, there was a question. Uh, would would you also say that uh, uh, de Sitter should uh, de Sitter theory should always come with an ensemble averaging? De Sitter space? Because because there are horizons always. I can't. I don't understand de Sitter space to say anything useful. In other words, regardless of whether I answered yes or no to the question, I don't know a good quantum description of de Sitter space. <clears throat> For anti de Sitter space, we have an understanding in which we can make precise statements but anything I would say about the sitter space would be vague. Now, so Brown and Nino discovered this stress tensor. <clears throat> There's a lot more to a conformal field theory than a stress tensor. But with the modern understanding, we really believe that <clears throat> in various string slash M3 examples, there really is a two-dimensional CFT with this value of C on the boundary of an asymptotically ADS3 universe. <clears throat> now, if you take a two-dimensional central uh, CFT of central charge C, its ground state energy is minus C over 12. And with the brown hino formula for C, we could write minus C over 12 as minus L over 8G. G is Newton's constant, L is the radius of curvature. And we're usually interested in the case where G is very, very small, keeping L fixed, because that's where we have a semi-classical picture of gravity that we're trying to interpret quantum mechanically. So another way to say it is that the analog of large N in our previous discussion is large C. So we're going to be 
anything we understand from the point of view of gravitational path integral is an expansion for large C, which as you can see means it's an expansion for G being much less than L. For a large beta, the partition function of any quantum system, trace e to the minus beta h, is dominated by the ground state, assuming it's non-degenerate and unique. So the trace will go for a large beta as e to the minus beta e naught, which is e to the plus beta L over hg. So in particular, the partition function grows exponentially for large beta. And it grows exponentially for a large beta and the coefficient of the exponential is very big if G over L is small, the usual semi-classical regime for gravity. How is this exponential growth reproduced in gravity? Well, recall the Einstein-Hilbert action where I've omitted boundary terms, which turn out to be not important in three dimensions. On shell, the scalar curvature is in three dimensions is minus six over L squared. So, well, the second term is a multiple of the volume and on shell, the first term is the multiple of the second. So on shell, the action is a constant times the volume. Now, of course, for normally volumes are positive. However, in ADS-CFT, you're usually interested in manifold X with a non-empty conformal boundary. Such an X always has infinite volume, but after suitably adjusting the boundary counter terms, you can define a finite renormalized volume V sub R. And there's a renormalized version of this formula. If everything was finite, the action would be V over four pi G. In the ADS-CFT correspondence, um, <clears throat> you have to renormalize the volume and then the renormalized action is the same constant times the renormalized volume. Importantly, when you renormalize the volume, you made a subtraction. Volumes normally are positive, but renormalized volumes are not necessarily positive. It's analogous to the fact that energy classically is positive, but when you define the quantum stress tensor, you make a subtraction and then the quantum stress tensor is no longer bounded below by zero even though classically it was. Similarly, the classical volume was positive, but it, we're interested in a situation where it was plus infinity. After we renormalize the volume, it's no longer positive definite. Well, since the action is a positive multiple of V, the partition function for small g is the exponential of minus the action, which is the exponential of minus the volume. And that's only the classical contribution, there also are one loop determinants and higher order corrections, but they don't, the, the gross behavior for small g is determined by the classical action. So for now, what we really care about is the exponential dependence on g, which comes entirely from the classical action. So let's go back to the question of how to recover exponential growth from ADS-CFT. We have to reproduce it from the exponential of minus the action, minus the volume, which means the renormalized volume has to be negative. And in particular, it has to have this value to agree with the CFT. So the renormalized volume has to be not just negative, but proportional to beta. So it's large and negative for large beta. In fact, what's called the thermal anti de space has exactly the right necessary negative volume. So I've written here the metric for the sitter space in Euclidean signature. So phi is an angular variable. T could have been a real variable, Euclidean time. But if we want to calculate the partition function at inverse temperature beta in the boundary theory, we should take T to be a periodic variable. And if you do that, this is what people sometimes call thermal ADS3. And it's a bulk manifold that contributes to the thermal partition function on the boundary at inverse temperature beta, and it has the necessary negative renormalized volume. That statement is equivalent to the computation of the ADM mass of ADS3 in the original BTC paper. Well, in three dimensions, the black hole threshold is at energy zero, as also shown in the original BTC paper. 
all exponentially growing contributions to the partition function come from states of negative energy, or in other words, from what we're calling subthreshold states. But since remember, since the threshold energy grows with C, if you look at a state, well, if you look at the and the kth state above the ground state, it's a subthreshold state when C is sufficiently large. Or if instead of fixing how many, how, that is the kth state above the ground state, if you fix that it has an energy of 72 GeV above the ground state, again, it's way below the threshold when C is large. So any state that you keep fixed in a simple way is a subthreshold state in the sense I'm talking about. States above the black hole threshold have positive energy and the propagation of such a state through imaginary time beta gives an exponentially decaying factor, not an exponentially growing factor. Now, uh, now we're going to consider a more complicated observable. Well, okay, what we want to do now is to consider an observable that can be expressed only in terms of the energies spins and couplings of the sub-threshold states. And then we'll investigate the question of whether such an observable is sensitive to any ensemble averaging. So, well, we'll think about the partition function of the boundary CFT on a genus two surface M. So I've drawn such a genus two surface and I've also indicated in red three closed circles, which I've chosen to be simple closed circles that don't intersect each other and they're homologically independent. And I've drawn the surface in a way that suggests a way it could be embedded in R3. It looks, the picture is meant to look like a surface embedded in R3. And if you embed that surface in R3 in that particular way, all three circles, A, B, and C are boundaries of disks. So the picture is meant to suggest what could be the three manifold X whose boundary is M. But there are infinitely many possible X's not suggested by this picture. The picture just suggests one of them. And I want to explain that the one that's suggested by the picture plays a special role if we ask the right question. So, well, let's consider pinching the cycle labeled A. Well, pinching means that we take the circle here to be very small. But from a conformal point of view, all that really matters is the ratio of the size of the circle to the length of this tube. So it's equivalent to take a very long tube in this direction or a very small circle in this direction. Either way, we're going to get an exponentially growing contribution to the partition function because the ground state energy is negative. So um, we're going to run into e to the minus beta times e zero, which will grow exponentially because e zero is negative. The e zero is much less than zero if c is much bigger than one, but it's always negative. So we'll get something exponentially growing when beta is large and we can make beta large the language hyperbolic geometry is used is to say that you, you pinch the cycle A, you make it smaller, but it's completely equivalent to say that you make this surface long in this direction or small in this direction. So in that limit, the partition function grows exponentially. To reproduce it from gravity, we need a three manifold X such that the renormalized volume goes to minus infinity when A is pinched. But we don't expect all terms in the amplitude that have exponential growth when A is pinched to be free of ensemble averaging. That's because even if the state propagating through A has negative energy, there may be black hole states propagating through B and C. So that's a key point for what I'll be saying. They're just stipulating that 
a negative energy state propagates through A, doesn't tell us what's happening through B and C or anywhere else on the left or right of the picture. So it doesn't ensure that we have an amplitude that we can describe only in terms of the couplings of the sub-threshold states. Suppose though that X is such that the volume goes to minus infinity when any of A, B, or C is pinched. Well, that means that this particular X is contributing to an amplitude with negative energy states propagating through each of A, B, and C. Suppose you cut M along A, B, and C. So literally take a knife, just take a knife and cut. So perhaps you can see in this picture that if you cut, all, first of all, if you cut on A, you'll get two disconnected pieces of Riemann surface. If you cut along C as well as A, this right one will become a three-hold sphere. If you cut on both A and B, the left one will be a three-hold sphere. On the right, the holes will be A, but you'll also see C twice, once this way and once this way. So the right piece becomes a three-held sphere if you cut A and C. The left one becomes a three-held sphere if you cut A and B. So if you cut along A, B, and C, you get a union of two three-held spheres. Now I've drawn a three-held sphere here, and I've labeled its boundary by sub-threshold states I, J, and K. Remember, a sub-threshold state is any state. You pick the one million and one state, it's a sub-threshold state for a sufficiently large C. And we're all making asymptotic statements about large C. So all, think of all states as being sub-threshold states. The path, according to the operator state correspondence of CFT, inserting a state on the boundary is the same as putting in a disk with a vertex operator at the center. So the path integral on a sphere with boundaries labeled by specified states is precisely a trilinear coupling of the corresponding three vertex operators. So this, this coupling is a three-point function on the sphere of vertex operators associated to sub-threshold states. Well, my conjecture is that the energies and couplings of sub-threshold states are not affected by ensemble averaging. So this particular lambda ijk is supposed to be free of ensemble averaging. According to our basic hypothesis, the energies and spins and trilinear couplings of the subthreshold states are not affected by ensemble averaging. I have a question, Edward. Yes. Uh, why are you assuming that the uh, IJK are subthreshold? I mean, there can be other states well, they of could be. positive energy that can propagate, right? Yeah, sorry, right. Okay. Suppose that X has negative normalized volume when any of A, B, or C is pinched. So there's a beta one, beta two, and beta three. Yes. And the partition function is a sum of something like lambda i j k squared times e to the minus beta e i, e to the minus beta prime e j, e to the minus beta double prime e k. You take all the betas large and you look at the, the part that grows exponentially in each of the three channels simultaneously. So the whole partition function has a contributions from all states and it has pieces that don't grow exponentially for large beta. But if we pick the lambda i j k squared depends on C. Sorry. We pick out by looking at a piece of the partition function that grows exponentially in each of three channels, a coefficient lambda i j k squared of C for three sub-threshold states. It doesn't depend on beta anymore because we picked out some coefficients of exponential growth in beta, but it still depends on C. But the claim is that that function of C doesn't have any ensemble averaging. It won't receive contributions from disconnected manifolds. Is that clear? Yes, it's, it's, it's fine. Yeah, I understand. Thank you. Sure. So as I said, the basic hypothesis is that energy spins and couplings of subthreshold states are not affected by ensemble averaging. So to state a prediction for hyperbolic geometry, that means that if, if M 
is a component of the conformal boundary of X and the renormalized volume goes to minus infinity when A, B, or C is pinched, then the conformal boundary should be connected and thus should consist only of M. <clears throat> so um, I hope it's clear why I'm stating this, uh, why this is the conjecture I'm stating. Um, to get exponential growth needs means a negative volume. So if X is such that its volume becomes negative when you pinch any of A, B, or C, that means that X is contributing to an amplitude in which sub-threshold states are propagating here, here, and here. But an amplitude with sub-threshold states in each of those channels is proportional to lambda i, j, k squared, where lambda is the coupling of those three states. I'm saying that these couplings of sub-threshold states don't have ensemble averaging. So it must be that this X has a connected boundary. Edward, just one clarification. Yeah. By yeah. sub-threshold states, you mean, uh, in this case, states with energy less than zero or states uh, which have finite gap above the, above the vacuum, above it's the vacuum? The it's the same because when we do the gravitational path integral, we, um, we're discussing asymptotic behavior for large C. So since the ground state energy is going to minus infinity with C, the, the gap to the black hole threshold is C over 12 and is diverging. So. But I could consider a state with a, a gap, which is C over 36 or something like that, which is still a negative energy state. I believe, well, that's a good question. It needs to be studied a little bit more carefully than I'm saying. I believe if you take the, any gap that grows with C, it will be enough for this argument. Okay, thank you. All right. Any gap from the black hole threshold that grows with C, I think will be uh -huh. enough. Okay. Because then you have exponential growth. Mm -hmm. And therefore you can only get a contribution if the renormalized volume is negative when any of A, B, or C is pinched. Okay, thank you. It might be it has to grow linearly in C. Uh, you might mm -hmm. want to look at the precise inequalities stated in our appendix. But my co-author, who's an expert in hyperbolic geometry, was trying to rewrite the appendix with slightly sharper statements. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, can I ask a question? Yes. So uh, the contrapositive of this statement would be that if you have a disconnected boundary, there is a bound on the volume. On the renormalized volume, is that how well, I the right bound will be zero. So to make the renormalized volume go to minus infinity can only happen in special cases. I'll state it more precisely soon, but yes. Okay. okay. Thank you. The basic idea will be that it's okay. So let the cat out of the bag. For this genus two surface I've drawn, the way of drawing the picture suggests a three manifold whose boundary is M. There are infinitely many three manifolds with boundary M. Their boundary could might have another component in addition to M, or it might be only M. But there's a unique solution of Einstein's equations whose renormalized volume has the property stated here that goes to minus infinity when A, B, or C is pinched. The unique topology that has that property is the one suggested by the picture, where you embed the Riemann surface in R3 in the way suggested by the picture and the three manifold is the interior. I was going to get to that answer more slowly, but that's the answer. So not only is the boundary connected, but there's actually a unique manifold that contributes to this coupling. So the, we would expect this statement to have a genus G generalization for every G bigger than two. So, if you take a surface of genus G and cut it on three G minus three independent circles, it'll, it'll decompose into a union of two G minus two, three old spheres. I've drawn it here for G equals three, where you need one, two, three, four, five, six circles, and you get four, three old spheres. If the normalized volume goes to minus infinity when any of the three G minus three circles is pinched, we expect the boundary to be connected and to consist only of N. So the mathematical part of my paper with Jean-Marc Schlenker 
consisted of proving two statements that together tell precisely which X's can contribute to a genus G subthreshold amplitude. So one statement is that when you pinch a circle, the normalized volume goes to minus infinity if and only if the circle is the boundary of a disk in X. Second statement is that if three G minus three independent circles are boundaries of disks in X, then the boundary is connected and consists only of M. And moreover, X is what's technically called a Schottky manifold. Uh, a Schottky manifold is the kind of manifold you think of first. So if I take this picture of a Danish three surface, it looks like it's been embedded in R3 in the way I've drawn the picture. It's actually hard to draw a genus three surface in a way that doesn't suggest the way to embed it in R3. And when you embed it in R3, the interior is what's called a Schottky manifold topologically. So this second or the, the last part of the second statement is telling us what I said here, that the only X whose volume goes to minus infinity in all three G minus three channels simultaneously is the one suggested by the picture. What makes Riemann surface theory subtle is what's hard to see when we draw this picture. When we draw the picture, it looks like there are three G minus three circles that are all, first of all, the picture suggests an embedding of the Riemann surface in R3. And then for that embedding, each of these three G minus three circles that I've drawn is the boundary of a disk. Namely, this one's the boundary of that disk. This one's the boundary of that disk and so on. What makes Riemann surface theory subtle is that there were infinitely many ways to embed the same Riemann surface in R3. And for each one, for each embedding, there would be a different set of circles that would appear to be distinguished. So that's Sorry. harder to yeah. Professor Witten, I have a question. Yes. Um, when you say 3G minus three independent circles, do you mean homologically independent? Yes, yes. I was trying to avoid technicality, but they're homologically independent non-intersecting circles. They're, okay, up to diffeomorphism of the surface, it's like this. In other words, a genus G surface with 3G minus three independent circles in this sense. No, my question, okay. the first homology group of a genus G surface is a rank, has rank 2G. So oh, how can you actually uh, how can you actually have three G minus three independent oh, circuits? They're, in, they're independent in the, in the sense that these are independent. They're not linearly independent, but um, ah, I see. Okay, okay. They, have distinct, they have distinct homology classes, but I think also they don't have any relations with coefficients of zero, one, and minus one. They they're okay. exactly like this. The, the the interesting picture is exactly this picture up to diffeomorphism of the whole surface. Okay, thank you. So Edward, sorry, one clarification, please. Yes. So in this picture, for example, if I keep the lengths of uh, all the circles uh, finite, except for one, which I take to zero, then the volume would go to minus infinity or would it not? For the X suggested by the picture, the volume goes to minus infinity when you pinch any of the circles. Any one of the circles, right? So that would suffice. I mean, in that limit, it would suffice to say that only the connected uh, well, three manifold if, would contribute. If I only tell you that the volume goes to minus infinity when you pinch the cy cycle uh, D, for example, yeah, there are infinitely many X's that do that. Mm -hmm. And they do not all have connected boundary. I see. And the physics is that if a subthreshold state is going through D, there could be black hole states going through all the other cycles. Yeah. But then in the, in the theorem, what is the necessary condition to say it definitively that there's a connected boundary? Um, if three, th we have a stronger result in the paper, but for the, the statement we need is this, if three G minus three independent one cycles are boundaries of disks, where independent one cycles means one cycles arranged like this. Okay. So for genus, if these if these six circles or any six circles equivalent to them by diffeomorphism of the whole surface. Okay, thank you. These six circles are all boundaries of disks. Then X has a connected boundary and consists only of M. And moreover, okay, X is the obvious X suggested by the picture. The reason we're interested in the 
the possibility that these cycles are boundaries of disks is the other statement that the volume goes to minus infinity if and only if gamma is the boundary of the disk. Sorry, Edward, as you're saying, there could be multiple manifolds where the vol whose all whose volumes goes to minus infinity. So there is some sense in which this particular X has the least negative volume, like the one where everything is getting pinched. The, well, I'd have called it the most negative. Um, it, this particular X has a volume in this picture, has a volume that goes to minus infinity in any of six limits. Uh, if you only ask for the volume to go to minus infinity in five of the six limits, there would be infinitely many possible axes, no matter which five you picked. Right. I'm just worried if in principle, we would sum over all of them. And if those had more negative volume because minus infinity is a bit of, is, is a limit, right? So do we have to order these various X's in sort of by their no, volume? No, it's a little bit better than I've said. So if a cycle is the boundary of a disc, the volume goes to minus infinity, like e to the minus beta times e naught, which is minus c over 12. So mm -hmm. e to the plus beta c over 12. Uh -huh. so the volume, when you pinch, the volume either remains finite or else it diverges precisely in this fashion. So if we take two of them to be pinched, it would be beta c over six, is that right? Well, two of them have independent betas. So it would be better to call it each of my... Yeah, yeah, beta one plus beta two c over 12. Yes, that would be better. Okay, okay, thanks. <clears throat> and for six of them, the sum of the six betas. So, uh, I have a question. Yes. So, is the understanding that? When you have black hole states uh, propagating in, in 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 the intermediate states, you have to sum over all possible manifolds. You always have to sum over all possible manifolds, but most manifolds don't contribute to these subthreshold amplitudes. Um, yeah. So then... I, in the at the end of in the last part of my talk, uh, assuming I have time for it. Uh, okay, we'll be running a little over across all the questions, but <clears throat> I will explain what I think is happening when there does appear to be ensemble averaging. <clears throat> okay. Okay, these are the two mathematical statements. Um, I was going to give at least a hint about one of them. Okay, as I've said, the statements together tell us that a subthreshold amplitude on a genus G surface, genus G surface M, only receives contributions from manifolds with connected boundaries, so they're not affected by ensemble averaging. So uh, the statement that there's only one X, we didn't need it, but it's a nice simplification. So this is what I told you, a Schottky manifold is the one suggested by the picture. <clears throat> so to the extent that a sum over classical solutions is enough, genus G subthreshold amplitudes can be computed just by the sum over Schottky manifolds. So there were two mathematical assertions. The easier one to prove is that if there are a lot of compressible cycles in, okay, sorry. So a cycle, like this circle is called compressible if it's the boundary of a disk in the manifold, as it is in the case of the three manifolds suggested by the picture. So I'll explain the basic idea of how to prove that if you have a lot of compressible cycles, then the boundary is connected in X is Schottky. So for the basic idea, suppose that A is the boundary of a disk. So I've drawn the disk. Now take your knife and cut, just literally slice through that disc. Well, in this example, you'll reduce to the case that the boundary consists of two components, ML and MR, the left and right component, and they have genus less than the genus of M. 
And then you'd complete the argument by induction on the genus. So if you know that, if you already know that um, X has to be Schottky, if its boundary has lower genus, then you'd be able to deduce by analyzing what happens when you code on P that the same is true for N. So it's not a very complicated argument, but I won't explain it in more detail. You can read about it in the paper if you wish. So the other statement that pinching causes the volume to go to minus infinity, if and only if we pinch on a cycle that bounds a disk in X, that's more subtle, especially the only if part. I want to explain the proof. I'll just give an example, which is known as a Fuchsian manifold. So what's the simplest, what's the simplest example of what we've been talking about? We've been talking about solutions of Einstein's equations with disconnected boundary, but what are they? Well, I'm going to describe the simplest one. The simplest example of what we've been talking about, let M be any Riemann surface of genus G and let D omega squared be a constant curvature metric on it. Then this, a simple thing, is a solution of Einstein's equations in three dimensions. The boundary consists of two copies of M, say ML and MR, one at minus t equals minus infinity, one at t equals plus infinity. So this is an example of what causes the trouble, a bulk man connected manifold with disconnected boundary. The two boundaries have the same metrics, so they have the same complex structures. No cycle in either ML or MR bound to disk in X. If you think about the topology of the situation, you might be able to see that. X is just the product of M times an interval. And if a cycle in M is not already a boundary of a disk, taking the product with an interval doesn't help. So we expect that the renormalized volume never goes to minus infinity. That's a special case of, what, of the statement I didn't prove for you. Indeed, a short calculation shows that for this kind of metric, the renormalized volume is a topological invariant. If you take the definition of the normalized volume, you, if you think it through yourself, you'll see that by a very short calculation, the normalized volume here only depends on the area of M and the area of a hyperbolic two manifold is a topological invariant. Now this, so this is an example. It has a disconnected boundary and the volume doesn't go to minus infinity. So it doesn't contribute to subthreshold amplitudes. It's got a drawback though. For the explicit metric I've indicated, we can't vary independently the complex structures on ML and MR. So we don't know what happens if say we pinch a cycle in ML keeping MR fixed. There's an existence proof that more general hyperbolic metrics exist where you can do this pinching independently on ML or an MR, but there's no explicit formula. So you need a better proof to know that the renormalized volume doesn't go to minus infinity. And that can be done by using properties of the Vey peterson metric and the stress tensor of the CFT. So the manifold M times R and others like it with disconnected boundary only contribute to amplitudes that involve black hole states, never to amplitudes that can be expressed only in terms of the energy spins and couplings of states below the black hole threshold. Anyway, that's what I'll say by way of evidence that the below threshold amplitudes show no sign of ensemble averaging. So I guess it's a good time to take questions if there are any more questions. Sir, I had a question. Am I audible? Yes. Yes, sir. If, if, yeah, yes, sir. If we have, if, if we have black hole states as, 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 a, as a measure of threshold, could there also be wormhole states? which is somehow related to the black hole threshold and can be used as well? I don't know what you mean exactly by a wormhole state. Like, an, 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 like entangled black holes. Well, an entangled black hole is a state in the tensor product of two Hilbert spaces. Whereas I was discussing states in a single Hilbert space. So if, if, if we take ML and MR, and, and we consider them 
and 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 we consider and we consider wormhole state with this which has a Hilbert product of ML and MR, will that somehow solve the, will that, will that somehow help in like, in, in, in changing something in ML and it'll, be, and it'll be conveyed to MR? Let me answer your question in spirit, but not try to take it literally. The, the reason that there's a problem here is that disconnected boundaries, connected manifolds with disconnected boundary make sense in Lorentz signature where they can be interpreted in terms of quantum entanglement, which motivates your question. But they don't make sense in Euclidean signature, where rather than quantum states, we're discussing numbers, partition functions, or matrix elements. Numbers don't have entanglement, unlike quantum states. So the paradox that underlies the seminar is that there isn't an analog of entanglement in Euclidean space. So I really think that that's the best answer to your question, rather than a technical answer to precisely what you asked. Well, thank you, sir. Sure. Any other questions? Um, yeah, I, I have a naive question. Uh, yes. Uh, so when you when you refer to uh, these uh, uh, states propagating through certain uh, cycles in the boundary manifolds, What exactly does that does that mean? Like when you when you say that a state is propagating through a, uh, through so a cycle, in, that... in quantum field theory, I'd like to be able to change the color, but I'm not good at it. Uh, so I better not try to change the color. So pretend this is red, even though it's not. Sure. So the partition function. Here's an exact statement in quantum field theory. A partition function or any amplitude, but the partition function is an example, can be exactly written as a sum over all states propagating in a given channel. And I call the state I, the state propagating in that channel. That's what quantum states are good for in quantum field theory. What quantum states are good for is that anything you want to calculate can be computed by summing over a complete set of intermediate states. So okay. if you cut once, you got to sum like that. If you cut three times, as I did in the lecture, and again, I wish I could show this in a different color, you get a similar formula. Then you get an exact formula sum over ijk, lambda ijk is squared. Well, let's see, I could have been more precise here. See, zl of i depends on the metric on the surface. If we were pinching, that means there's a long tube this way, and there would have been a factor e to the beta, e to the minus beta e naught, e naught of the state i, not e naught, e i. So, if, if I define these partition functions of the left and right with the tubes in between projected out, then I'd have had the, such a formula with explicit factors of the energy of the state. So to make that true, I should draw the picture more like this. So. I'm propagating through an imaginary time beta. There's a state i. I have an exact representation of the partition function. It's a sum over all states. Each state is weighted by a factor e to the minus beta e i times factors on the left and right, which I'm calling z l of i and z r of i, that don't depend on beta. There, are, if you like, you take only the, this part of the partition of the manifold to compute z l or z r. So. All statements refer to exact notions in quantum field theory that, that are the reason that quantum states are useful. As I said, uh, before the seminar started, I was briefly talking to one of your colleagues who works on loop quantum gravity. And I remarked that I'm working on the canonical formalism from a very concrete point of view, where I simply start by asking what question it's supposed to answer. The basic question it's supposed to answer is that amplitudes can be factored by summing over states. So in that other project, 
I simply construct in an elementary fashion, but unfortunately only to all workers of perturbation theory, the Hilbert's bias of states, which have the property that they appear in the formula I just described. Right, uh, that, that was me that uh, you were talking to. So. Oh, I'm sorry, I apologize. Yeah, no, that's okay. Okay, uh, uh, thanks I, for I, the class. I have a quick question. Yes. Uh, so the evidence that you just showed, does that uh, say anything about whether pure gravity in ADS-3 has a CFT dual or not? No, I tend to believe it does not, but I don't have anything to, to say that sheds light on it. Okay, so, so to the connection to hyperbolic geometry does not require any assumption on whether we are... Uh, no, yeah. no. We're not, I should have perhaps made that clear. We're not necessarily discussing pure gravity. We're discussing any example of the duality in D equals three that arises from string slash M theory, where the bulk theory is gravity plus some light fields. Okay. And therefore the bulk theory has Einstein manifolds as classical solutions. It might have other classical solutions. And the technical analysis I've given is limited to these solutions where only the metric is excited. So one of many questions you could ask is whether our conclusions are still valid if you relax, try to enlarge the class of contributions you consider. I believe the answer will be yes, but not for technical reasons. The reason I believe the answer will be yes is that we got an answer that makes sense. <laughs> it's the answer, we got the answer we should have expected because in many examples of the duality, there's no ensemble, as I said at the beginning. So therefore, if we ask, if we ask a careful question, we should see that the answer does not require an ensemble interpretation. Since we got an answer that made sense, I expect that if we do a better calculation, we'll still get an answer that makes sense. But I don't have a sufficiently general theorem to prove that. I have a question. Yes. Uh, so, so, in general, <clears throat> ensemble averaging is associated to quantum chaos. I mean, even when black holes yes. are present, it is because the chaotic that you have to uh, average our ensembles in the JT gravity case. Now, is is it generically true that all chaotic systems have gravity duals, or there can be some chaotic systems which don't have gravity duals, and then this uh, wouldn't work, right? Well, there are a lot of questions there. So, first of all. What you said is one of the reasons I suspected that what I've said would be true. So uh, you, what you said should be qualified. Uh, maximally chaotic systems have duels by semi-classical gravity. Almost every system is chaotic, but a system that isn't maximally chaotic doesn't have a duel by semi-classical gravity that we understand. You could ask whether every chaotic system has some kind of strongly coupled gravity duel that we don't understand. But since we don't understand it, I can't answer the question. All I can say for sure is that maximally chaotic systems have semi-classical gravity duels and almost maximally chaotic systems have duels that are close to that. But when you talk about all chaotic systems, it's probably true that most chaotic systems are far from maximal chaos. Although that's probably not known to be for sure. But anyway, what I wanted to really get to is that what it was known, I'll say prior to the work I'm reporting here, is that many examples that have maximal chaos above the black hole threshold are actually integrable below the black hole threshold. Integrability is as far from maximal chaos as possible. So you're correct that the evidence for integrability is tied to black hole physics. And I thought that if we look carefully at the observables subject to integrability, we would see that they don't show any sign of ensemble averaging. And that was true as I've tried to explain, although I didn't really, I didn't explain in a precise fashion the proofs of the mathematical assertions, but I hope I've at least helped you understand what you'd want to know in order to assert that the observables subject to integrability, the observables that do not involve black holes uh, don't show any sign of ensemble averaging. I hope I answered at least some of your questions. Uh, you, after uh, we've got, 
would you say a gaussian unitary ensemble is maximally chaotic or not oh i better not say yes or no to that without thinking it probably depends on what question we ask i, I don't want to say anything on the fly well, let's come back to your questions after i've told you what i think ensemble averaging means in the case of black hole states because then you might have more questions anyway okay uh, sure we're actually over time already and i haven't gotten to uh, the but, last part of the talk on yeah, ensemble we, uh, yeah we usually don't have uh, a strict uh, one hour bound so please take your time uh thank you well uh, so uh, clearly if we're going to explain why black hole states show signs of ensemble averaging we need an explanation that involves a difference between subthreshold states and black hole states so i want to suggest that these two facts are the key difference well one which was part of the last question is that black hole physics is highly chaotic and that's familiar uh, it, it was part of the background to the work uh, where GT gravity was interpreted in terms of an ensemble average. And it's this insight is built into a lot of contemporary work on black holes. The second statement is also elementary, but I don't think people have focused on it quite as much. The energies and couplings of black hole states do not have a large end limit. Not only they don't have a large end limit, but they don't have a, any kind of regular behavior for large end. So the point about chaos is well established, but the assertion that there's no large end limit may seem less obvious. But let me ask, in what sense could you hope for a large end limit for the black hole Hilbert space? The entropy, say, at fixed temperature grows as a power of n. So the Hilbert space, when n is 10 to the 6 plus 1, is much bigger than the Hilbert space when n is 10 to the 6. Almost all states are new. They don't come from states that were there when n was less by 1. In the somewhat analogous case of the large volume limit of quantum statistical mechanics, the accepted answer is that the Hilbert space does not have a large volume limit. That's actually why the thermal field double state was introduced in rigorous approaches to quantum statistical mechanics. It does have a large volume limit. Likewise, in the black hole case, the thermal field double entangled state of two black holes has a large end limit. But there's no reason to believe there's any unknown sense in which the black hole Hilbert space has a large end limit. In saying the black hole energies and couplings do not have a large end limit, I mean that in the most general sense that you could think of. I mean they have no regularity for large end beyond what we already know. What regularity do we already know? Well, we know that the entropy and similar averages over the spectrum is a smooth function of energy spin and n. We also know that certain average functions of couplings. Uh, such as this average, but sorry, I shouldn't have written a sum. Well, if, I, if I'm writing a sum, I should have weighted the sum by energies so that you pick out certain ener energy bands. But anyway, certain average fu functions of couplings, such as the average value of lambda ijk squared for ij and k in a certain bands of black hole states. These averages initially studied by Cardi, Maloney, and Maxfield likewise are smooth functions of the energy spins and n. So we know a lot of regularity about the black hole spectrum. And the regularity we know basically says that the statistical properties of large of the black hole spectrum have a regular behavior. Edward? Let me say one more sentence. But my assertion is that there's no regularity of the black hole physics beyond what we know. So I'm saying that ensemble averaging reflects the fact that there are no unknown sense, there's no unknown sense in which black hole physics is regular for large n. Yes, go ahead. So do we expect uh, this statement to be true even for 116 BPS states in n equals four, uh, whose energy scale like n squared? That's a good question. So um, 
those have black hole horizons, I assume, since their energy scale is n squared? Yes. Yes, right. Um, I think so. I think it will be true even for those states. But I'd like to come back to the question at the end of the talk. Okay. So I'm going to proceed assuming that there are no surprises. There's no unknown sense in which black hole energies and couplings have any simple behavior for large n. I'm going to assume that the only simple behavior is what we already know, that various statistical properties have a smooth behavior. Given this, consider any observable curly W that only depends on the Hamiltonian H sub N of the black hole states in a theory with given N. The most important such observable is the partition function for a sufficiently small real beta, but we can consider any W. I think what I'll say will be clearer if for the moment we consider a more general W. <clears throat> Chaos means that as far as any simple measurement is concerned, HN looks like a pseudo random matrix drawn from an ensemble that's determined by the thermodynamic functions. If the spectrum has no regularity for large N except what follows from thermodynamics, this suggests that the HN for different N are independent draws from an ensemble of random matrices where the ensemble is characterized by the thermodynamic properties, such as the entropy as a function of energy and other conserved charges. Two qualifications are needed, which are stated here. One, the ensemble itself depends non-trivially but smoothly on N, since the entropy is a smooth function of N. Two, as I'll explain at the end, the HN for different N are not truly statistically independent. They're only exponentially close to being statistically independent. But for the moment, just imagine that the HN are completely statistically independent draws from a random ensemble. If that's true, then an observable that depends on HN will be a smooth function of N, only if it's self-averaging in random matrix theory. In random matrix theory, an observable is called self-averaging if it has almost the same value for almost any draw from the random matrix ensemble. Sorry, Edward, just to understand. So you usual random matrix ensembles have matrices of a fixed size, uh, but here the entropy will depend on N as well. So. Well, I don't, I would say that usually when, well, you could study a random matrix ensemble for matrices of a fixed size, but the interest is usually in the large N behavior. And usually you pick an ensemble that has a limit for large N. Here, we're also interested in the large N behavior because we're doing some kind of asymptotic analysis for large N when we do the gravity partition function. But it's not true that our ensemble has a limit for large N. It depends smoothly on N instead. For example, the entropy is quite N squared. Okay, maybe I'll ask you again at the end, thanks. I have a question. Uh, the yes. different ensembles could depend differently on the couplings as well, right? Not only yes, N. Yes. Well, there are models where N is the only coupling. But if there are more couplings, they should be included here. So when I said, when I said that there's no regularity except we already know, what we already know is that the black hole entropy depends smoothly on N and any other couplings and various other things. But whatever we know, we, all, we know is a function of all the couplings. No, so so in general, it, it's not necessary that N be different from for different uh, ensembles. You could have different couplings which differ them. Well, when we do the gravity path integral, we're making an asymptotic expansion for small g. So here, when I say N, I just mean a coupling that g depends on and that controls how big Newton's constant is. So when I say large N, you could think of it as being small g. You could replace n in my statement by any parameter that Newton's constant depends on. And we're discussing how what black hole physics looks like when Newton's constant is getting smaller. So the statement is that there's no regularity except what we already know. We're not going to discover any surprises 
we're not going to discover any miraculous new regularity of black hole physics, except that it has a nice statistical behavior. It's governed by quantum mechanics, but we're not going to discover, for example, that the black hole spectrum in some presently unknown sense has a large end limit. What I'm asserting is that apparent ensemble averaging reflects the fact that there's no surprising regularity that we don't know about already for black hole physics. I have, did I answer the question? Uh, for instance, G animals is related to the uh, G Newton, right? Yes. In, in, in an equals for say super animals theory. So even, even if you keep N fixed and vary G animals, it would no, be. No, no, that's not. You don't go if you if you vary G angles keeping n fixed. You don't go to a limit where the gravitational path interval is under control. What you do is just you make the uh, rays of curve. You make things worse. You make the theory more stringy. But you don't make you don't make gravity more weakly coupled. Uh, the, sorry, the gravitational path interval is really controlled by n. Okay. People usually, okay. but I think it'll turn out if you think more carefully, maybe you should let me proceed with what I'll be explaining. I think what I'll be saying will be valid in any limit where the gravitational path integral is under control so that the discussion of ensemble averaging arises. So for example, the partition function is believed to be self-averaging for sufficiently small real beta. But if we give beta a sufficiently large imaginary part, it's believed to be no longer self-averaging. With presently known methods, we can only calculate smooth functions of Newton's constant, which I'm calling n. So we can only calculate the expectation value of w if w is self-averaging in random matrix theory. Remember, self-averaging means that w is more or less the same for every draw from the random matrix ensemble. And then the statement is that we can only by present, we're only going to get a smooth function of n. When we change n, for each n, we're getting a different draw from the ensemble. So since those different draws are statistically independent, we're only going to get smooth answers for different n if the observable we're computing is self-averaging. So for example, we can calculate the partition function for small real beta Uh, sorry. Well, anyway, we can calculate the expectation of W if W is self-averaging, <clears throat> but not if it isn't. However, if W is not self-averaging, it may still have a non-zero average in random matrix theory. In that case, its average would be a smooth function of N, which we might be able to calculate with known methods. <clears throat> Since, okay, more generally consider K functions, W1 up to WK that only depend on the black hole Hamiltonian. Whether or not the Ws are individually self-averaging or have non-zero averages, their connected correlation function may have a non-zero average in random matrix theory. If there is a non-zero average, we might be able to calculate it. <clears throat> so, what present methods might be able to calculate are smooth functions of n that would really be averages in random matrix theory. So for example, if there are two of them, we might be able to calculate something like this. If this expression has, an, an, it has a non-zero average in random matrix theory, we might be able to calculate that. That's what I mean by the sub C, the connected correlator. But present methods wouldn't enable us to calculate anything that depends in an irregular fashion on N or G. Now these general considerations don't tell us how we're supposed to do the calculation. And I can't prove the answer, but let's specialize to the case that the Ws are all partition functions with different values of the betas. Given all that we know about path integrals and quantum gravity, the obvious hypothesis is that the connected, the connected correlator of the product of Ws 
average over nearby values of n is supposed to be calculated by summing over manifolds x whose conformal boundary has k components, each of them appropriate to one of the w's. So each one is a copy of S1 times a sphere, where the circumference of the circle in the rth copy is the rth beta. So nothing I've said proves that this is how we're supposed to do the calculation. But I have explained that the um, observables we might be able to calculate are in one-to-one -one correspondence with the methods of calculating the observables that we have. And therefore the obvious hypothesis is to match the observables with the calculations. So this is the obvious hypothesis to interpret what we're calculating in the gravitational path interval. So the proposal is that this is the meaning of connected amplitudes with disconnected boundary for the case that the boundaries all have this particular topology. The reason for that topology is just that if the observable is a partition function, then this should be the topology. With more general, the reason I uh, considered this, well, I considered this observable first because random matrix theory, by considering observables that only depend on the Hamiltonian, means we're discussing random matrix theory rather than random CFT. Random CFT is certainly understood less. If we want to consider more general boundary manifolds, we have to talk about pseudo-random CFTs and not just pseudo-random matrices. So what would we mean by a pseudo-random CFT? Well, the couplings lambda IJK of black hole states are constrained by suitable crossing relations that they satisfy. If you want to satisfy the crossing relations and all other CFT axioms exactly, then it's believed that there's no appropriate ensemble from which they can be drawn. That's the paradox we started with at the beginning. But if we're just discussing asymptotic expansions for large n, it's plausible that there's a large ensemble of asymptotic solutions of the crossing relations. That would be analogous to the following. Unitary and physically sensible relativistic S matrices are believed to be scarce, but in low energy effective field theory, there's a vast swampland parameterized by the coefficients of all possible local operators in the effective action of relativistic S matrices that make sense to all orders in a low energy expansion. So the proposal would be that the CFT that governs black hole states for a particular value of N if you're only able to asymptotic expansions for large M, it looks like a pseudo random draw from a vast swampland of effective CFTs that only makes sense asymptotically for large M, not exactly. For nearby but different values of N, you get almost independent pseudo random CFTs. So observables that are sensitive to the black hole spectrum are smooth functions of N only to the extent that there are self-averaging quantities in random CFT. So we can only compute quantities that have non-zero averages in random CFT. What we compute are smooth functions of N that are smooth approximations to the observables of interest. So going back to the question with which we started, when we compute, um, this uh, observable, by summing over all connected manifolds X, whose boundary has K components and is a disjoint union of them, what we get is a smooth function. This should have been a smooth function of N, not M. That's really an average value of the observable we're discussing, averaged over nearby values of N. That's the proposed interpretation of the apparently ensemble average value, sorry, apparently ensemble averaged answers we get from the gravitational path integral. So a short summary is ensemble averaging is really averaging over nearby values of N to get a smooth function of N. We don't actively average over nearby values of N. We're trying not to, but we, we sort of get an implicit average over nearby values of N because we, what we're able to compute are smooth functions of n. 
Can I ask a question, Edward, at this point <clears throat> about the last slide? There is a, as you know well, that in low, in uh, simpler models, we have the phenomenon that there are phase transitions of higher order at large n. Yeah. So you, you, so what will happen to this uh, uh, statement of uh, that ensemble averaging uh, leads to smoothness in n? Will there be a problem? I'm confused about the question because there you're discussing an ensemble to begin with. Um, do you want, are we doing it in zero dimensions or in quantum mechanics, zero plus one? Uh, well, we know explicitly only uh, in uh, lower dimensional models. I mean, in zero, zero dimensions, one, 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 yeah, zero dimension or zero plus one. Well, but in zero point. dimensions, the, see, the two are quite different because in zero dimensions, it's a random unitary matrix that you're talking about. So there isn't anything that's not ensemble average, as far as I can see, below or above the transition. But in one dimension, you're discussing a definite quantum mechanical system with a large n limit. And the, what I was. Sorry. I'm confused about whether there's yeah, a good no, I mean, I was just trying to say that uh, uh, given those examples which you mentioned, the phenomenon of uh, having a phase transition at large n may also be present in a more complicated theory in the higher dimensions, for example, in n equal to four super angles theory. Yes. Yes. Well, it is, of course. The Hawking yes. transition. But then, uh, then in that case, uh, these averages uh, may not be smooth, actually, functions of n. Well, usual observables are smooth functions of n. So take the unitary matrix model. Yes. Unitary, the usual, if you take the trace of a finite number of, trace of u to the k for a yes. finite k when goes to infinity, yes. the product of finite many observables of that kind is a smooth function of n. I think it's a good question whether you can find something that's sensitive to physics above the transition and which is not smooth as a function of n. I don't know what it would be, but I wouldn't rule it out. Okay. Okay. You have to try to imitate trace to e to the minus beta h, where beta has a large imaginary part. Okay. Uh, Thanks. Uh, a problem with the analogy, if you take the unitary matrix model, is that it is an ensemble average. The analogy is better if we had something that isn't ensemble averaged. Yes, yes, yeah. If we do the same model in one dimension, it's a definite quantum mechanical system. Yes. I believe it would be true that there would be low energy observables that wouldn't look like ensemble averages, but I don't know whether there are high energy observables that would appear to be ensemble averaged. Anyway, there are potentially good questions there in either zero or one dimension, but I can't say more on the fly. I do want to conclude by saying one more thing. I want to explain the statement that the theories with different but nearby values of n are only exponentially close to being statistically independent rather than being truly statistically independent. That's because in known examples, the theories with different n are unified in string slash n theory and are connected by domain rules. So here again is a manifold with two different boundary components, a connected manifold with disconnected boundaries. But now I've wrapped a brain in the interior and that wrap brain causes a jump in N. So the N is different on the two boundaries. If one has N, the other has N plus one, assuming the brain charge is one. So this manifold computes a connected correlator between partition functions with different values of N. And that connected correlator is not zero, but it's small because of the brain action. So the connected correlator gets an ex the, the action that you need to compute the connected piece gets an extra contribution from the brain, which would not be there for the disconnected piece. So the connected correlator is smaller than the disconnected one, exponentially small. So that's what I meant when I said that for different values of n, the black hole Hamiltonian is only exponentially close to being statistically independent for different values of n. Thank you, that's what I had to say, I guess. To summarize, I give an evidence that the energies and couplings of states below the black hole threshold are not affected by ensemble averaging 
And I've proposed an interpretation of apparent ensemble averaging for black hole states. Thank you. Thank you, Edward. Thank you for a great talk. Let's all uh, thank Edward. Um, any questions? I have a question. Go ahead. So, so uh, going back to my previous question, suppose you have a chaotic system which, which corresponds to a Gaussian unitary ensemble. That, as we know, that that doesn't in general correspond to any black hole kind of picture. So, Sorry. are you just discussing the Gaussian unitary ensemble as a quantum mechanical system? Yeah. I mean, a chaotic system. Okay. So just as you have this JT gravity random matrix theory correspondence, yeah. you could have a random matrix theory which is constructed out of Gaussian unitary ensembles. Yes. And those wouldn't correspond to any black hole states like the JT gravity case. So in that case, would you say that this picture works? Oh, sorry. Well, let me try to interpret your question as follows. Take gauge theories that are integrable for large n. Yeah. For fixed energies, they're definitely not chaotic, far from chaotic. They still can have what you might want to call a Hagedorn transition rather than a Hawking page transition. They still have deconfinement transitions. Yeah. And above the deconfinement transition, there might be no semi-classical black hole interpretation. Nevertheless, the physics above the deconfinement transition is chaotic. If you ask a question sensitive to the chaos, yes, I think you will get an analog of ensemble averaging. Yeah, that, that's precisely what I wanted to say. If, if I may just ask uh, maybe a different version of the previous question. In the, so you mentioned you want to average over N. Is no, there I don't want to average over N. I'm saying we average over N without intending to. Yeah, without try, intending to. We try to study the theory at fixed N. Yeah. But the calculations we know how to do produce averages over N. But just because it, they produce, let me finish that. Just sense. because they produce smooth functions of N. And in the case of a, and smooth functions of N are averages because certain observables do not depend smoothly on it. Right. So I was asking, do we expect there to be a non-trivial measure for the average over N? Like, let's say we computed it for each, we had all the power to compute it for each value of N. We, well, if we could compute it for each value of N, we wouldn't be having this discussion because we'd understand, sure. we'd understand everything. What we know how to do is only asymptotic expansions for large n. Computing for each value of n would mean solving the theory exactly. But that's something you should never expect to do. So take QCD. You might be able to solve QCD asymptotically for large n. The reason you might be able to is that the physics is simple. For large n, QCD is a free field theory with energies, masses, and spins that we don't know, but nevertheless a free field theory. For large n, asymptotically in the one of n expansion, the physics is still simple. It's a weakly coupled theory that can be described in perturbation theory with some massive spins and couplings, which again, we don't know. But it's imaginable to know that stuff. For n equals four, we do more or less via integrability. It's I not imaginable. Let me finish a little bit. Yes. Mind. It's not imaginable, for example, for n equals three to ever solve QCD. That, would, <laughs> that describes things like nuclear explosions and neutron stars. It's not imaginable, in my opinion. That nuclear explosions and neutron stars are governed by integrable systems are soluble. So solving the theory for large n is not what we would ever be able to do. What we might be able to do is have a description, a, a description of the bulk theory for large n that in some sense made sense and made unitarity or resolution of some black hole paradoxes manifest. But we would anyway. And yeah. Proceed with the question. Yeah, I guess I'm not asking it very clearly, but um, uh, because if there is a proposal that the gravity is computing averages over n, yes, 
it it might not come with just a flat measure dn right so if if we are averaging over some nearby values of n yes yes i've given this talk a few times and i think you're the first person to ask the, a question that draws attention to the weakest points in the proposal so the weakest point in the proposal is that saying that gravity computes averages over n is a somewhat vague statement without being able to explain precisely what kind of average over n gravity is computing yeah yeah so correct Thank you. Okay. Um, and then I wanted to ask, so let's say we complexify the metrics on the manifolds M. Yes. So that would be computing things like the spectral form factor. And, yes. uh, and so well, is, there, is there a theory for hyperbolic manifolds with complexified metrics in which you could make similar statements? Because, uh, yeah, yeah, that's my question. If you complexify a little bit, since, comp since hyperbolic manifolds are real analytic, they can all be complexified a little bit. But I don't think people study very much what happens when you complexify them a lot. Anyway, I can't tell you anything useful, unfortunately. Okay, okay, thanks. Sure. I have a question that was asked at the beginning of the talk uh, by Shiraz, uh, I don't know if he's still there. Uh, so the, the question was, you said that if you look at four point functions of light operators, they're not subject to ensemble averaging. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, if one looks at the exponentially small terms in that in that four point function, they do receive some contribution from states above the black hole threshold. And one might have thought from these general arguments that those contributions should also be subject to this nearby n averaging. But I mean, how, how does it happen that, uh, uh, that, 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 yeah, that that averaging doesn't play a role even in the exponentially suppressed terms for low point correlators or uh, light operators? Well, let me tell you something very naive. You're asking about a sphere. So um, now we want to fill it in with the classical solution. The only one is ADS3 itself. Uh, I see, sorry. So that would be the statement that one doesn't receive a contribution from these? Sorry, I didn't understand. Uh, I think if you wanted to see a black hole contribution in this four point function, you should take extreme values of the, um, you should take extreme values of the uh, cross ratio or something like that. Could I make a comment on this? I was just thinking uh, during the talk, if we go to the CFT row variable, uh, it maps the entire Z plane to a unit disk. So then the contribution of any operator goes like row to the H where H is the dimension of the thing. And rho is always less than one. So if H scales with C, that contribution is zero. Is that that's it's not zero, no, it's exponentially suppressed. I mean, but that's what you, you expect. I mean, even the la loss of factorization is in the same form, no? I mean it's rho to the C, so it's it's something that's exponentially suppressed with C, but it's not zero. Well, <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, you're right. You see, there isn't a classical solution that's going to do what you're trying to describe. And I'm actually claiming there's nothing that would do what you're trying to describe. We could make it slightly, I see. Okay. Okay. So my lecture was limited to classical solutions. So you could ask, is it wrong if you consider things that aren't governed by classical solutions? I have a time limit. Oh, okay. I really have to go strictly in five minutes because of the meeting at 10. Um, so um, in the literature, there's only one non-classical solution that's been studied. And that's actually the spectral form factor. Well, it was somewhat inspired, I guess, by Saad, Shankar, and Sanford, but uh, Cutler and Jensen uh, discussed it in terms of a path integral on a non-classical solution, which had two torus boundaries. It wasn't a classical solution, but it had the same prop. They proposed a formula for the partition function on T two times R. I can't promise their formula is exactly correct. 
but I think it's probably qualitatively correct. And their formula qualitatively shows what I've been saying. There is no contribution for subthreshold states because there's no exponential growth when beta becomes large. So you have, if you ask a question about the three-point function or the four-point function in genus zero, there's no classical uh, solution that would contribute an ensemble average contribution. And you can ask me if there is a non-classical solution. I don't know how to make technical statements. So all I can tell you for sure is that where in the literature people have discussed non-classical solutions, the behavior that was claimed is completely consistent with what I'm saying. So yes, yeah, so I'm claiming that there's no contribution like you're asking about. Okay, thank you. Sure. Sorry, can I just ask a very quick, uh, uh, very nice question? Uh, mm -hmm. I know you have to go, but you know, a very quick answer would be very helpful, I think. Okay. So, uh, I mean, so you have these classical solutions which actually can time evolve into a black hole. Like, you know, you can start from a state which is not, which is not a black hole, but you can like collapse and form a black hole, right? So how would you interpret those states? Uh, so you as a scattering amplitude, you're not keeping the center of mass energy fixed. You're taking the center of mass energy large. So you're right. Roughly, well, let me not give a technical answer, but in spirit, to be in the regime my lecture was about in the first part of the lecture, we keep the states and the energies fixed uh -huh. as momentum becomes small. I did want to make one technical statement about the four point function on the sphere. It doesn't explain everything. So there's no classical solution that leads to any puzzle you're asking about. But you can ask, could there be a non-classical solution? There's also no proposal in the literature. But there's a trivial reason that any calculation with a non-classical solution either gives zero or infinity. The reason is that um, you could make a conformal transformation of the boundary, an SO D plus one, one transformation. Well, maybe I should go with little d, the boundary dimension. Mm -hmm. There'd be inevitably collective coordinates. Mm -hmm. uh, you could make a, if there's a contribution like this, there's also one that you make a coordinate transformation, conformal transformation of the boundary. It doesn't extend over the interior. So you'd get a non-compact moduli space. And it's easy to see by taking a limit while the points approach each other, that the, this integral would diverge. So although the literature doesn't contain any attempt at a non-classical uh, contribution to this, it's easy to see that any such contribution is either zero or infinity. So I assume it's zero actually. Um, I can take two more, I can take one more question in two minutes if there's one more question. Edward, do you have any further comments about this uh, supersymmetric states on 16 BPS? Whether one could uh, test the hypothesis in any, in any sense? Well, I'll, uh, there's one thing I wanted to say, which is that I actually believe that generically black hole microstates are not a well-defined concept because mm -hmm. to build a black hole, you need to have classical causality, which is only valid asymptotically for small g. For small g, in the asymptotically for small g, you can have a classical notion of causality in the bulk and you can definitely say you have a black hole. Since the Hil black hole Hilbert space doesn't have any kind of regularity for large n, to have a microstate, you have to have a definite value of n. And then you do not simultaneously have a black hole. So generically, there's no sharp notion of a black hole microstate. Whereas you are asking about a case where there is a sharp notion of a black hole microstate, namely the BPS states. So my first, the only comment I'm sure of is that I think that's the only case where a black hole microstate is a sharp notion. Mm -hmm. I'm reluctant to say too much more, but if okay. I had to guess, I would guess that there's no regularity for large n. So in yeah. principle, one could go towards answering questions such as the measure over which this should be averaged and such, in principle. In principle, but uh, it sounds like a tough job, but... Um, yeah, okay. I don't, well, I don't know whether there's a BPS protected three-point coupling of such black hole states. Mm -hmm. That sounds no. like too much to look for, but I don't yeah. know if you were untrue. Do you know? By any chance? No, I don't think I don't think uh, the three point functions are protected. Okay, I think it's going to be hard, but I think that it's a good good idea to ask about such questions for the states you're talking about, 
because they're exceptional, because that's a case where black hole microstates are a well-defined notion. Mm. Yeah, for example, the superconformal index, uh, now you know people think that it does receive contribution from 116 BPS black hole states. So, so there one could actually try to probe this question somehow. Well, whether you can probe them, I don't know, because that's why I asked about the three-point couplings. So not well, the three-point well, couplings. Well, you, you can ask if the index is subject to ensemble yeah. average. Yeah, yeah, yeah so exactly. Equals, yeah. I'm afraid I didn't write this up, but for n equals two JT gravity, I did. The question arises, there's, there are BPS states for n equals two JT gravity. Uh -huh. And I did a computation showing that the um, BPS spectrum, BPS index is not subject to ensemble averaging. I perhaps should have I written see. that up. I, see. I, I didn't think of it in this context until you asked just now, literally. I did that computation two summers ago. I and I didn't make the connection with the present lecture until you asked about it. So thank you. Thanks. I That's very useful. I'm getting late. I'm going to have to go. Thanks. Yeah. I have to thank everybody for the excellent questions, which were very stimulating, including the last one, which, as you can see, raised a point I hadn't thought about. Thanks a lot, Thank you. Thank you a lot. Bye-bye, everyone. Good luck. Bye. Stay well. Bye.